I'll ask our elders and John to come to the platform, please. One of the great joys during the life of the church is to set aside men for the eldership, to serve together, to oversee the church, to shepherd God's people, and to minister and serve in the word. And um, our joy and is in discipling men who live out the word, being qualified, have a desire for the word. Here in our church, you must have a desire to shepherd people or you cannot be an elder. This is not merely a ruling position, but it is a shepherding position where we shepherd people and shepherd ministries and we teach things into existence through the preaching and the teaching of God's word. God's word tells us then to set aside men together to serve as elders over each church. And it is our privilege this morning then to ordain John Diello to the eldership of Clear Creek Chapel. I ask Pastor Tim Reck to come and lead us. Okay. Okay. John, if you'd just uh, step forward a moment. Yeah. <laughs> we first of all want to thank you for your willingness to, uh, to serve in this way. And, and uh, we just have one question for you, and then we'll pray over you, okay? All right. John, by God's grace and enabling, do you commit to faithfully serve as an elder here at Clear Creek Chapel? I do. I do. All right. So, John, after carefully examining, examining you according to the biblical qualifications of character, conduct, and doctrine, we, Clear Creek Chapel, before its members and guests today, joyfully, joyfully ordain you to the office of elder to shepherd and oversee the church under and through the ministry of God's word. All right, thank you. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we are in awe of how you work uh, in our world, but most importantly, how you work in your church. And Father, you have given, uh, through your Son, good gifts to your church in the form of people who are spirit-filled and who love you and who you have gifted with various abilities. And uh, Father, so we just thank you at a time like this when you raise up from among us an elder willing to serve with a great desire to to shepherd people and to contribute to overseeing the church so father we just say thank you and we rejoice in that and father we ask that you would bless john that you would work in him in a way that uh, he would grow in his knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. He would grow in his giftedness and his uh, abilities to serve as an elder, mature him, grow him, Father, in grace. We pray that you'd protect him, that you would guard his heart as he serves among us. Father, keep him from the temptation of, of uh, serving under his own strength or in a way that's not uh, under your word. Keep him aligned to your word, Father, for in it um, you do much and you bless us much. And Father, I pray for we as a body. May we be an encouragement to John. May we uh, lift him up in prayer often and frequently. And Father, may... Um, May we joyfully submit to his leadership in his respective ministries. And may we uh, just be a joy to him as he does his work among us. Father, bless him. Give him many years here of fruitful ministry. And I pray that uh, we would not lose sight of our part in that in helping him. So we lift him up to you. And we ask, uh, again, that you'd bless him. 
but more importantly, Father, that it would be to the end that you may be glorified. You may be raised up by the faithful work of John uh, in our midst. We pray this in the great name of Jesus, who has gone before us, who is the model of eldership. We pray it in his name. Amen. It has been part of our custom, our tradition, for the elders to sit down front with a new elder. But due to our current circumstances of gathering, we've chosen not to do that. And um, so there's an opportunity to preach a charge uh, to John and to all of the elders to remind us of our great responsibilities before God and with his people. Take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Here it is. The Word of God. The Scriptures. They are God-breathed. They are sufficient to equip the man of God for every good work. They are useful and profitable in each sphere of life and ministry for all the steps and stops of bringing the elder handling the word of God and the preacher of the word and the people under the word to bring them to maturity. Now there are many tasks and responsibilities that the word of God gives to the man serving as an elder pastor. He must oversee the church alongside of the other elders. He must shepherd the people who are put in his charge. He must guide and guard and grow the church. He must feed and he must fend for his sheep. But there is no greater responsibility for the pastor elder than the minister God's word in teaching and preaching. And so we gather this morning to preach this charge to this man, John Diello. We come knowing that he can be thoroughly and completely and fully equipped by the word for all that he is to do. So in the light of this then, how does the scripture-equipped man minister? How does he serve? Solomon's serious words that are here in this text answer that question. For the man of God has the sufficient scripture, and the text rings with a powerful clarion call to to preach the word, to proclaim God's truth, to teach the Bible. God, through his gifts and his providences, excuse me, and his shaping of you as a person, has made you able to teach. So in all of the challenges that you, John, will face and the charge that you receive, remember that the word is central. In all the ways you minister, in all the ways you serve God through his word, This charge, though mostly about your responsibilities to and under and for the word, also also calls you to a grace-enabled obedience by faith in every aspect of your ministry among us. And as you move forward in God's grace and by his spirit, John, I want you to hear the word of this charge as we speak and as we have prayed over your life and ministry. This charge in 2 Timothy chapter 4 opens with a stirring exhortation in verses 1 and 2. Here are words that can make saints and elders tremble. Before the face of God, herald the word God's way, even when people won't listen. Do so from a life that authenticates your message. Paul writes to Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God, 
and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience in teaching. And so this stirring exhortation comes in the form of a solemn charge in God's presence and by His appearing, proclaim, motivating power to fulfill this charge rests in the God we are serving. The awesome depths of His solemn majesty will keep us serving all the way until the end. Our lives and ministry are open before His face and we serve in His presence. It is not just that He sees and knows, but there is an accounting that will be given to the one we are serving. And what we do now, we do in anticipation of His appearing. What we do now is only the beginning of the kingdom that will one day be made full and complete in the presence and in the sight and for the present pleasure and for the future glory of our great king, preach the word. Now ultimately, your preaching is accountable to God and not to man. And yes, now you're going to function as one among a body of elders whose corporate understanding of doctrine holds you accountable. There is, after all, the faith to be taught, to be held, to be proclaimed. But in the end, you answer to God. It is not your job to be liked. It's not your job to be popular or even, frankly, to be accepted. Now, it is possible for you to win wide acceptance and admiration and still be faithful in preaching. But we also must remember that faithfulness to the Word will bring dislike and disapproval from many. However, we must have a sense in our study and our preaching that it is from the Word of God, it is to the people of God, and it is before the face of God. And so this calls for humble courage to preach integrity and with clarity. And what is it that you are supposed to do? Well, you are to preach the word. This comes from a Greek word that means to herald, to proclaim publicly, to announce with authority. You are not to speak as though the word were the evening news or a political rally. You are not to speak as though the things you say are just suggestions are mere human insight. You are to proclaim them as living, vital truths. You are to speak with authority. You are to be truly infused with the sense of the reality of the things that you speak. You are to strive for authenticity that bleeds over the text you are studying and sings over the text when you are preaching. And it is the word that you are to preach. Now hear me, brothers. There will always be a subtle temptation from preaching the message of the Bible to preaching about the Bible. You replace the message and the meaning of the text to a kind of preaching that is about the Bible's text, rather than what is God saying through the text. Now to look, and it will sound biblical, because after all it is about the Bible, but it is not preaching the message of the Bible. It is not preaching the Word. And there's a subtle temptation to shift from preaching the message of the Bible to preaching the theology from the Bible. You replace preaching the actual flow of the argument in the text with using the words and the phrases in the text 
to a launching pad to do theology that oh, may well be behind those words and ideas. The subtle danger here is that we soon begin to impose our theological frameworks on the text rather than preaching the truths through the text. And there will be a subtle temptation to preaching topics gleaned from the Bible. Uh, thus the Bible becomes treated as an encyclopedia of theological, doctrinal counseling, leadership, you name it now, truth. You are first and foremost responsible to preach the Bible in the form that God gave it. Treat the word you preach with respect and integrity. Trust that God knew and understood what he was doing when he gave us his revelation in the form that he did. Do teaching and preaching that is not only from the Bible, but also follows the Bible. And then there's a subtle temptation to preaching that uses the Bible to show ourselves off. And thus our preaching becomes an excuse for and an exercise in self-glorification. May God preserve us. May his grace impart humbleness and meekness. May what ability we are given and we cultivate be used to serve God's purposes and to highlight his glory, not our own. May we always stand under God's word and always stand behind his word. And never, ever may we be standing in front of his word. And we are to herald God's word in a timely moment. When are we to do this? In all seasons. We must be reasonable. We must be ready when it is a seasonable time for the word to be heard. And when it is not. There will be seasons of mercy when people will listen. And there will be seasons of hardness when people will not And there will be seasons in our own lives when we're full of God's power. And there will be times where we will not. And there will be seasons when our own lives, but we all must have times, the sufficient word in our hands to meet the need of the hour and the people. Because brothers and sisters, it does not rely on us. It relies on God. We must feast from it ourselves. We must be transformed by it ourselves. We must believe it in an obeying way ourselves. So what we say to others will be real to us. I've occasionally sat under preaching, thank God not here, where I walked away and said, that man does not believe what he just said. And we're to do it by a required method. Our preaching of the word is to be characterized by all these words. Reproof. Our preaching is to expose and convict with authority and even severely if necessary according to Titus 2.15 and 1.3. We are to do so as an expression of God's love and discipline. Revelation 3.19. We must have a sense of earnestness about sin and its effect on people's lives. We must rebuke, not because of some personal affront, God forbid, but because God's holiness is being violated and His glory is being tarnished. We must reprove. We must rebuke in our preaching. Our preaching is to mete out an appropriate and just correction. It must be designed to gain the attention of the sinning ones and to cause them to halt from their sin. Those who sin and are preaching should be comforted when in distress and distressed when in comforts, to quote an old Puritan. We must exhort. 
Our preaching is to motivate and to provide steps of action so that people will want to move forward and will to some degree know how. From these words we can see that our preaching is to penetrate the heart and must do so by informing the mind must call for obedience from the heart while depending solely on the grace of God to cause what we are calling for. If we cause it, it will not be lasting. And all of this is to be tempered with great patience and is to be saturated with instruction. We are hurried and impatient in the strong words of our preaching. It will simply become negative. And critical and corrosive. Great patience and able instruction make even the bad tasting medicine of correction tolerable. We must powerful communi- powerfully communicate the word with patient application arising from clear instruction in it. Our communication of truth ought to profit all the sheep in some way. So we must be clear and challenging and convicting and above all, Christ-centered. So instruction is fundamental to our preaching and must fill it. And our instruction must be proclaimed and heralded with power and with patience. But why should we do this? What is its motivating explanation in verses 3 to 5? And I don't want you to miss the connection. The word must be preached with readiness, reproof, rebuke, exhortation, and great patience and instruction because there is a time coming when people simply won't have it. They will hanker for something else and will do all they can to avoid it. This then is the environment in which you preach and in which faithfulness is called to listen to what Paul says to Timothy. Verse 3, 4, there's the connection, right? 4, the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. They will turn away from listening to the truth, and they will wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Now I want you to notice that this charge to preach the word faithfully in and out of season with all of these things embedded in great patience filled with instruction is to be done at a time when people don't want it. So here is, this, here is the sad decline That will be the context of Timothy's ministry and often is the context for our own. As the times and epochs roll, more and more will people not endure sound doctrine. They just won't have it. And the result is that doctrine is rejected and de-emphasized. People cannot stand to hear the sort of sound teaching of the word. Why? Why is that true? Oh, the root of the matter is in what they want. They want the kind of preaching that is pleasing and that is palatable. It must tickle the ears. It must never thunder. It must never challenge. It must be like an expensive scotch that goes down smooth. The fruit manifests itself in three ways. They accumulate teachers who will follow their desires. Now notice then who is leading in the preaching. People will turn away from the hard meat of doctrine to the sweet chocolates that will be offered them. They collect those who say what they want to hear. You must never be this sort of preacher. You must preach with your people's real needs in view. They'll come with their felt needs, and in this day, these felt needs are often used to identify those that they will listen to and those that they most certainly will not. 
And so they turn away from the truth. When one rejects doctrine, one is in the process of turning away from that which is true. It's inevitable. It is a terrible thing when people think they can reject what is true and still have truth. How does that work? How do you reject doctrine and still think you have truth? But what happens when people turn away from truths? They turn to myths. You see that in the text? When one turns from truth in rejecting doctrine, you have to turn to something else instead. And Paul calls these myths. They are the deceptions that people live by. They are how people explain life. And if they're not true, then they are lies. If they're not truth, They are myths. And sadly, this is what people will crave and desire and want, even from the preaching of the word. I don't want that. I want this. And there are many myths to which even religious people turn. In the face of the myths of evolution and self-esteem and pragmatism and individualism, what we must do is preach the word. But you must be different. You must not be someone who will accumulate teachers just to your own desires. You must not be someone who turns away from the truth, who then turns to myths, but rather you must be different in verse 5 and a needed contrast. What great words these are and so much needed today, just not by modern day Timothys, but by all God's serving saints. But you, keep your head. Realize that you need a serious and reflective approach to life and ministry. More and more we are besieged by frivolity and levity. What is needed are joyfully serious saints. And you need a level-headedness for the days ahead. This calls for, in Piper's words, gravity and gladness in ministry. There must be seriousness because of what is at stake and there must be gladness because God is behind it all. Keep your head in all things. Do not let the immediate emergencies knock you off keel. Stay the course. Keep your head. Endure hardship. We must hear this call to all of us. Our lives and our ministries are so easy. Where is the enduring hardship? Well, I answer 3 a.m. phone calls. Where is the enduring hardship that comes every week to evening worship and to flock gatherings? Where is the enduring hardship that will overcome self to give the gospel, to serve widows and help others at all hours? Endure hardship? You've got to be kidding. Get up from your TV's your stereos and your leisure and your and sacrifice what in the world does taking up the cross mean to this generation taking on the eldership will be hard challenging difficult time consuming painful it might even call for you to give your life maybe And you can turn in your ordination certificate if. But I challenge you to read through the book of Acts with an eye to what hardship meant to Paul. I think you will see that it is not merely the inconveniences that attend to ministry, but the great suffering that sometimes falls on the choices of God's servants. Do the work of an evangelist. Now Timothy is not an evangelist. He does not have the gift of evangelism. But in all of ministry he can do the work that an evangelist does. 
That is, he can preach the gospel in his preaching. And so can we, and so will I, and so will each elder here, and so must you. You will, in our church, do the work in evangelist. And when God gives you the opportunity, do the work of an evangelist in preaching. Speak to sinners about the supremacy and the salvation of God. Press evangelistic text home to our people. Cause them to consider carefully whether they are truly in the faith. Finish the job. Do everything that your ministry requires. Do both the work you enjoy and the work you do not. Keep your sense of balance. Your first love will probably be studying and preaching and teaching. But there will be administrivia to do as well. There will be people with great and deep needs who will press on your time. Finish the job. Do everything your ministry requires. Study as you ought. Preach all you can. Shepherd faithfully. Organize and administrate as needed. And this means to do it every week until Jesus comes, whether he comes in your death or comes at his parousia. The essence of Paul's exhortation could be summed up in this Short phrase, just do well. Do well, because Paul has set us an example of what it means to die well. Here is an inspiring example that Paul set for us in verses 6 through 8. How many failing and faltering hearts have gained hope and received grace to finish from these words? What a great aim this is. Verse 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me but also to all who have loved his appearing. And so Paul sets an inspiring example in his facing death, verse 6. You see, facing death for him was simply the departure of a fully sacrificed life. His life was already being poured out. At some point, this great sacrifice will end in a departure. Interestingly, not as soon as he thought. In the flourish of youth, it is sometimes hard to think of death. But you will not live well and you will not minister faithfully unless death is an ever and present and glorious and full of gain reality. Live and minister in such a way that there will be no sense of regret when God's providence is bringing you to that day. He sets us an inspiring example in his finished course. Verse 7. What a mighty confidence to have at the end of one's life. It is a life of the good fight, well fought. The heavenward race, well run. The standard of faith, well kept. Reach forward with all of God's grace to hit the finish line still accelerating. And he sets us an inspiring example in his future reward. There's a crown of righteousness to all those whose future hope shapes their present living. Do we love his appearing? We will if we are devoted to the one who is coming and have done the duty he requires of us. Do you love his appearing? Do you hunger for God and for the beatific vision of his great glory? In the face of Christ. And so, in conclusion, your charge. Beloved, preach the word. Finish the race. Do well. Die well. Love God. Love his people. 
For God has rescued us all from our sins and will rescue us all from every evil deed and will bring us safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Father, it is a serious and solemn thing to take upon ourselves at the call and ordination of others the role, responsibility, and privileges that attend to being an elder among your people. And Father, even as I thought about and reread and prayed over and applied to my own life these words, I pray that the sense of reality in my own soul will enliven and awaken courage and enable John and all of our elders to serve you, to do well, to be prepared to die well, to be faithful to the end, to love you and to love your people and to do so all for the glorious day when you will appear and you will crown us not only with righteousness but with the reward commensurate to our service. And so Father, Help us to be people who love you through your word, who live for you by your word, and who long for you because of your word. And may we at the end of our lives, in the end of our ministries, be able to say, the word has done it all. For this is your plan. This is your purpose. These are your providences. This is your power for the moment. In Jesus' name.